Over two centuries ago, this ancient fabric was the most expensive fabric in the world, 26 times more expensive than silk. And anybody who was anyone was wearing it. From Marie Antoinette to the Romans, the Mughal emperors, the ancient Greeks, and even Jane Austen was writing about it. But the crazy thing is, for the last 200 years, nobody has been able to make this fabric. This is the story of the Dhaka muslin and how it disappeared from the face of the earth, maybe forever. So in order for us to understand the story, we have to go back to Mughal India during the time of the British East India Company, which at the time was probably the most powerful private enterprise in human history. At its peak, it had an army that was twice the size of the British army. And by the mid 1700s, it was controlling half of Britain's trade globally, selling everything from cotton, silk, salt, spices, and even opium. Yes, the opium wars were caused by the British East India Company, but we'll get to that some other time. Okay, so within the British East India Company, there was a guy named Robert Clive, sometimes called Clive of India. And in 1757, he seized control of the state of Bengal, which was part of India, in the southeast side, which is now known as modern day Bangladesh, and there's some of it that's actually still in India. And he seized control and became the governor of that state. He was essentially controlling the customs and the tax collections. So the years that followed after Clive took control of Bengal, the East India Company continued to expand their territory, started taking control of other provinces, either by using their private massive army or by creating alliances and partnerships with other governors in other states. So effectively controlling all of the trade coming in and out of India. At the same time in Europe, there's something really interesting going on. In the 1700s, there was like a period of self-expression and that was creating a lot of different changes from the fashion perspective. The idea of relaxed style was very much in. When you look at fashion in the 1600s, you'll notice that a lot of people were wearing these really massive, especially women, wearing these very massive dresses that can hardly fit through the door and basically people got tired of carrying their body weight around in clothing so they said forget that let's change the style and because of the trade that was happening from the East India Company new types of fabrics that were lighter and more beautiful were coming in to Europe and the thinnest and finest cotton fabric of them all was the Dhaka muslin so to understand why the Dhaka muslin was so important we have to understand thread count it's probably a term that you heard when you're buying sheets for your bed but essentially, thread count is the number of threads in one square inch of fabric. So if you have a 200 thread count sheet, you probably have 100 threads going vertically and 100 threads going horizontally. Most of the clothes that we wear today that are good quality cotton probably have somewhere between 150 to 200 thread count. But in contrast, the Dhaka muslin had 1,200 thread count. Just think about how fine the threads had to be to fit 1,200 threads in one square inch of fabric. In fact, the threads were so fine, it essentially gave a translation lucent effect. So the thing about the Dhaka muslin is that it was made using a very complicated 16 step process and each process was done in a separate village in Dhaka. To make things a little bit more complicated, the cotton had to be picked from a very specific plant that only grew on the riverbank Meghna and it was called the Futikarpas. Unlike the cotton that makes up 95% of the materials that we wear today, which are long slender fibers, the fibers of the Futikarpas were short and very fickle and very delicate. If you know something about fabric and yarn spinning, you'll probably say that those long slender fibers are actually better and they're more sturdy and more stable. And that's absolutely true in the context of industrial manufacturing. The machines that we use to make these cotton yarns operate much better with longer slender fibers. But the short fickle fibers of the futikarpas is what ultimately allowed the dhaka muslin to be so fine. And that process of creating yarn using the short and fickle fibers was essential to actually creating the Dhaka muslin. At the time, a yard of Dhaka muslin could cost anywhere between 50 pounds and 400 pounds. In today's currency, that's somewhere between 7,000 and 56,000 pounds. So you can imagine when the rise of popularity for the Dhaka muslin started to emerge, the East India Company were thinking, this is a big opportunity for us. So the East India Company did what they always do. They seized control. By the late 1700s, the East India Company started to employ these individual artisans and brought them into their factories stripping them of their self-employed status to becoming essentially an indentured servant. The East India Company started to force these artisans to make more and more fabric and paid them less and less. If you're in a fashion industry, that story probably sounds familiar. But not everyone was so happy. You have to remember at the time, the British economy in textiles was 
primarily wool and silk. And a lot of the people in the government had significant interests in these factories, and I mean direct financial interests. So you can bet that there was quite a few unhappy people with the fact that this DACA muslin, or cotton in general, was creating a lot of problems for their business. So as a result, a series of bans were placed on cotton fabric and DACA muslin. This was called the Calico Act. And even though the British government put a ban on cotton fabric, it didn't do anything to slow down the demand for the DACA muslin. Eventually, admitting defeat, a lot of people in Britain decided, well, instead of trying to shut down the demand for cotton, which was clearly growing, maybe we should become the cotton fabric producers. And this resulted in a proliferation of cotton mills across the UK, starting from Lancashire. You even started to see knockoff DACA muslins being produced in the UK with lower thread count, lower quality, but masquerading as DACA muslin. Back in Dhaka and in the state of Bengal, where a lot of these materials were initially being produced at exploitative prices, things started to change. The artisans made such little money making this fabric, they were essentially working at a loss. And as a result, a lot of them had to leave their jobs and go and become farmers to feed themselves. And slowly but surely, this combined with the fact that now the British were trying to produce that same fabric resulted in the disappearance of these artisans and the disappearance of the plant itself, the Futi Karpas, resulting in the ultimate death of the Dhaka muslin and any artisans that were able to make those materials. 200 years have passed since that art and that craft was destroyed. Even though the East India Company meticulously noted those 16 steps, they were never able to recreate it. And today, muslin is mostly just a lightweight, cheap cotton fabric. Nothing like the original Dhaka muslin that was worn by the royalties across the planet. But in 2013, Saiful Islam, who's a British citizen born in Bangladesh, heard about this story and decided that he wanted to rediscover the Dhaka muslin. Over the next few years, he met with lots of people in Bangladesh and tried to figure out if anyone knew how to make it or at least had some of the original Dhaka muslin available. And nobody in Bangladesh did. But the crazy thing is that actually one of the largest collections of Dhaka muslin that is around today is in the VNA. So over the last several years, Islam has been working with a variety of different scientists and experts to figure out how they can recreate this fabric. But the first step was to find that original plant. Now we know that over the years, that plant has essentially disappeared. So he needed to find a genetic match. Luckily, he was able to find a dried leaf of the Futicarpas preserved in a booklet of the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew from the 1800s. And because of modern technology, he was able to sequence the DNA of this plant and he started to search for a genetic match across the Holy River Magna. And to much of everyone's surprise, he was actually able to find a 100% genetic match. Several months later, they were able to reproduce their first harvest of this short and fickle fiber. Using the 16-step process that the British East India Company had carefully put together, they were able to create their first replica of the Dhaka muslin. But they couldn't get to the 1200 thread count that the original Dhaka muslin had. And it took them an entire month to just make one sari. This is just the beginning of the journey that Islam is taking to rediscover those ancient artisan techniques that were necessary to create such a valuable fabric. The Dhaka muslin is just one of many treasures lost due to greed, short-termism, and obsession with profit. And centuries later, it feels like the fashion industry has not learned its lesson. It continues to operate with an obsessive focus on reducing cost, and the industry fails to understand the consequences and costs of this relentless pursuit of lowest cost. 